So I'm going to take off from where uh, architect Anupama left off and uh, this is really shows a way how um, a typical design project unfolds in our firm where initially the architecture team looks at the site uh, in addition uh, with the environmental context comes up with the forms, the spatial layout and once that is frozen then the green building advisory team joins the project and also comes and works along with them to work on the finer aspects of the energy efficiency and the other environmental aspects of the project. So in this particular case study today, we are going to specially focus on the building envelope design and the design was specifically done to ensure energy efficiency. Given that the facility was going to be primarily naturally ventilated, we wanted to make sure that the building would be naturally cool and comfortable for the occupants without the use of extensive conditioning. So in this regard, we used as many as six different strategies. You can think of them as passive strategies, you can think of them as building envelope strategies, but these were conscious design choices that we made to make sure that the building stays cool and comfortable, which is very important for assuring the productivity and the well-being of the occupants. So if you look at the strategies, uh, number one was obviously the building shape and orientation on the site. The second one, which again architect Anupama already talked about, is the central courtyard. It is a feature that is essential to keeping the spaces well ventilated, airy. And this is something that we've drawn upon from the historical design context of Tamil Nadu, where central courtyards are key features of old uh, buildings. The third strategy was the spatial layout of each space, each re regularly occupied space was done in a way to maximize cross ventilation. So we wanted to make sure that because it's a naturally ventilated building, there will be breeze movement throughout the day and keep the interiors airy. The fourth strategy was wherever fenestration happens, we wanted to make sure that it was adequately shaded. This again in a tropical zone, in a warm and humid zone, is very important that uh, the direct uh, sun ray does not fall on fenestration, also does not fall on the walls because that is where most of the heat gain is going to happen. The fifth strategy that we used was making sure that the building envelope is insulated. This includes the wall, obviously the fenestration and also the roof to make sure that internal heat gain is minimized. The sixth strategy was all the regularly occupied spaces should have access to glare free natural light. Oftentimes it is seen, especially in contemporary buildings where there's a lot of glass used. Yes, there's a lot of light coming in, but often it comes with so much glare, which again forces the use of internal shading. So these were the six strategies that we employed in this project to make sure that the spaces inside are cool, comfortable, and give a productive environment for the students and the faculty. So the first strategy, again, Anupama has already talked about it, but I'll just walk you through in the context of energy efficient design. So again, the circular form made sure that there is no direct heat gain on any facade. Uh, and specifically, the way the forms are cut out, the smallest segment faces the west, which is where in that particular area is a lot of heat gain. So we ensure that the west facade is the smallest, also curved. So this helps minimize the heat gain from there. The breezeways, as Anupama talked about, brings a lot of airiness into the central courtyard. And from there, it moves into the various rooms. And again, uh, the sloped roof, which is very traditionally used in, in a hot tropical place like India, is that through the day, the sun's direct exposure does not keep falling on the flat surface. So this is again a key strategy in making sure that the heat gain into the building was kept at minimum. The second design strategy that we used was, again, something that Anupama has referred to, but this was the central courtyard. So the open central courtyard from a usage point of view was a key aspect of bringing in socialization, interaction among the occupants. But from an energy efficient point of view, there were two uh, aspects that we looked into here. So one is that the courtyard itself is open on the top and this forms a stack effect. So as the air inside the space gets hot and heated up, it rises and then finds a way out. This in turn keeps forming a circulation. So the breeze comes in from the openings and goes up. So this whole thing keeps the central courtyard airy and comfortable. The second part was the conscious decisions to keep the openings into the courtyard along the prevailing wind direction. So the wind comes in from the south, exits through the north, and in that process spreads into the courtyard and funnels breeze into the regularly occupied spaces. So this was the second strategy that we used. Here is uh, an image of the central courtyard, so it gives you an idea of how the space looks and feels. 
Uh, so I, as Anupama mentioned, there is the statue of uh, Buddha right in the middle that brings a visual focus into the center. Uh, there are three levels, the ground, the first and the second, and uh, the courtyard uh, on the top. While the central part of the courtyard itself is, uh, has a glass cover uh, to avoid rain, there are openings on the sides so the hot air can go up and then exit from the side. You can see from this behind the Buddha statue is the opening towards the east and that's again a direction from which natural light comes in and then as the sun moves up, it comes in through the top and then moves on to the west and that's where the built form on the west shields the harsh sunlight during the afternoon part of the day. The strategy number three that we used was ensuring that the spatial layout of all the regularly occupied spaces lent itself for good cross ventilation. So as we, you know, the building is circular and it has a central courtyard and all the regularly occupied spaces are arranged around it. So if you look at anything, for example, the training hall number one, it has openings towards the exterior as well as towards the courtyard. And then when you open out the fenestration, the breeze naturally comes in and flows from the outside into the courtyard or vice versa depending on the time of day and the breeze direction. So this uh, arrangement of spaces makes sure that cross ventilation is happening, there's also natural light coming into those spaces, so it keeps the interior generally comfortable. Add adding to that the stack effect of the courtyard makes sure that hot air, whatever forms, goes up and exits out. And because of this kind of an arrangement, Space conditioning was kept to a minimum and, and you know, generally used only during peak summer days. Strategy number four is the adequate shading of fenestration. So what we saw here was um, there was a need to have a lot of openings to bring in natural light, also ventilation. But given that, how could we make sure that the internal spaces don't get heated up? Uh, this is something that is very well known to people who have cars. When you have an op option to park, you would rather park it under a shade than keep it open. Similarly, whatever fenestration we create should be well shaded in a tropical place. So here what we did was we decided to overhang the roof and the slabs at various levels to make sure that adequate fenestration uh, covering is achieved. This again then turned into a functional usage which added to the charm and the usability of the building. So for example, wherever the slabs were extended out, those became balconies, step out spaces. So between classes or during seminars, the occupants have a space to come out, enjoy nature, then go back in. Uh, it also definitely adds to the aestheticness of uh, the building. Um, but the main and important point is that the shading makes sure that direct solar radiation is not impacting the uh, fenestration or the walls for that matter. Then this in turn makes sure that it's only secondary uh, heat uh, through conductivity and not through radiation that gets into the spaces. This also ensures that there is no direct sunlight and light going into the uh, spaces which again reduces the glare in that space, makes it much more comfortable, gives adequate light but keeps it at a comfortable lux level. What we did was the slab overhangs were about six feet and this led to a reduction in the SHGC, which is the solar heat gain coefficient, by 40%. So this allowed us to also make sure that we can select uh, a glass that has uh, the right amount of solar control, but has adequate uh, visual light transmission also. So this was the fourth strategy that uh, we employed. Moving on to the fifth strategy, and this is uh, formed a, a core part of the envelope design was to make sure that the building envelope was uh, well insulated. Uh, in this uh, regard, we had a reference to the uh, IGBC's uh, green new building rating system. So given that the building was meant to be naturally ventilated, we wanted to make sure that the envelope um, uh, heat conductivity uh, aspects were well in line with this rating system. So some of the uh, design benchmarks we considered were number one, the window to wall ratio was not to exceed 40%. When you do that, uh, you uh, have a little more leeway in some of the other factors where it is uh, required to bring in enough light. Directly, this leads into the solar heat gain coefficient of the fenestration. So as per this standard, we should not exceed 0.42. What this means is that if solar radiation is falling on a, a piece of fenestration, 42% of the heat the infrared part of the radiation can come into the space, the rest is kept out. While 42 was the minimum level, 
as per the standard, the ideal level was 0.32. So what we wanted to do was make sure whatever glass product we choose, that along with the shading that we create makes the uh, solar heat gain coefficient not go more than 0.32. The next factor we considered was again another aspect of the glazing which is the U value or the thermal conductance. Uh, for somebody who is, uh, may not be familiar with this term, the U value is the extent of heat that can go from one side of a surface of a, a piece of object to the other side uh, in one square meter of area when the thermal gradient from one side to the other is 1 degree Celsius. So this gives a way to quantify how um, thermally conductive a certain object is. So in this case, the, as per the standard, the maximum uh, heat gain that you should allow through glass was 5.7 watts per meter square Kelvin. So what this means is that in every square meter of glass, if there was 1 degree centigrade difference from the inside to outside, not more than 5.7 watts of heat should go through. This also leads to the fact that going back to the window wall ratio, so more extent of fenestration you give, that is the kind of heat that can flow through the glass. The fourth uh, aspect we look at was the thermal conductivity of the exterior wall system. So while we may show that the windows uh, do not exceed 40 percent of the built form, the facade, we now need to look at the, um, the thermal conductivity of the wall itself. So here again as per the standard, uh, we should not exceed more than 2.5 watts per meter square Kelvin and ideally not exceed 1.8 watt watts per meter square Kelvin. And the last um, aspect we looked at was the U value or the thermal conductivity of the roof, which again in a warm and humid uh, region should not exceed 1.2 watt per meter square Kelvin and in an ideal case should not exceed 0.5 watt per meter square Kelvin. So to just explain why there are two benchmarks we are looking at. As per the IGBC Green New Building Standard, which draws upon the ECBC or the Energy um, Conservation Building Code of India, these, uh, th this strategy is typically called a prescriptive method, where uh, the rating system or the standard gives certain benchmarks. And you as a designer will try to keep uh, your uh, building's benchmarks below this, um, as, as per the case be. So here there is a minimum, which is uh, looked at as a mandatory requirement and an ideal which is looked as an enhanced requirement. So ideally we should be achieving the enhanced requirement, but at the least we should be conforming to the minimum benchmark. The, the, some of the things that we need to look at is sometimes when you are trying to achieve the ideal benchmark, there is a cost associated with it. And specifically in this project where cost consideration was a key um, a factor that we had to consider, making sure that we meet and adhere to some of these benchmarks without greatly shooting up the cost was a key consideration. So if you look at the exterior wall assembly, what we again considered was number one as I mentioned earlier, the thermal conductivity. So in the ideal case, we should not be exceeding 1.8 watts per meter square Kelvin, but at the minimum, we should not exceed 2.5 watts per meter square Kelvin. The second aspect that helped us choose a proper wall material was the aesthetics which um, being rooted in the cultural context of the space uh, called for exposed masonry. Uh, and this was not the only reason. The other reason was uh, to consciously and have a sensitive material use policy where we said we will not use material unnecessarily. So again, avoiding plastering of these walls, make sure that uh, a polluting uh, 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 material like cement, it is minimized. So these were uh, two of the aesthetics and cost related factors that went into the selection of a wall material. Here we looked at three options uh, given these two uh, 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 factors. One was conventional clay bricks, the kind of bricks, uh, kiln fire bricks that are normally available. Uh, and generally the U value of a wall, uh, a 9 inch or three, 230 mm wall uh, plastered on both sides or plastered on one side would be around uh, 2.5 watts per meter square Kelvin. We also looked at hollow uh, clay blocks or hollow terracotta blocks. Uh, these are typically larger blocks which have several voids uh, across the cross section. Um, its U value, if you look at plastering on one side, comes to about 1 watt per meter square Kelvin. And the last um, option we looked at was fly ash bricks, where uh, a typical 9 inch uh, fly ash brick wall uh, would lead to a resulting uh, U value of about 1.3 watts per meter square Kelvin. So we looked at these three and we 
obviously wanted to go for the lowest U value product. So we looked at hollow clay blocks. It had the best U value. It had the aesthetics that would suit the building. And it also allowed us to leave it unplastered, which also worked well with the material use strategy. So the wall material that we used here was um, hollow terracotta clay blocks. Uh, and this typically has a thickness of eight uh, inches or 200 uh, mm. The next factor we considered was the roof assembly of the building. So again, the first aspect that we looked into was the U value or the thermal conductance of the assembly itself. And here, as per the standard, we should not exceed 0 0.5 watts per meter square Kelvin. And in the worst case, not exceed 1.2 watts per meter square Kelvin. And again, this is in the context of the region which is warm and humid. So given the, the climatic context, the standard says ideally you should not allow more than 0.5 watt in every square meter of the roof. The kind of options we considered were Manglo tiles which uh, worked well, would work well with the aesthetics of the building. Uh, we could also look at an RCC uh, roof uh, or something like a metal sandwich uh, roof uh, with insulation in the middle. In this particular case, uh, we went with the metal sandwich uh, roof. So this is a cross section which has two metal layers with a layer of grass wool in between. The reason for this was number one, it yielded the best U value of 0.5 uh, watt per meter square Kelvin. RCC could have been used with some over deck or under deck insulation, but the form of the building uh, and the, the, the tricky shape makes it a little harder to use RCC in this uh, form. And again, that was one of the reasons why Manglo tiles was also not as suitable. Uh, and the final reason is that Manglo tiles, though aesthetically beautiful and do have some amount of uh, thermal insulation, they don't come close to this uh, kind of a value that we were looking for uh, from the IGBC new green building standard point of view. So by now, so we've uh, selected the wall material, we selected the roof material. So we move on and uh, we're looking at the fenestration now. So again, some of the factors we looked at, just to reiterate, was that the solar heat gain coefficient should not exceed 0.42. And ideally, it should not exceed 0.32. So that means that if a sun's rays were to fall directly on that fenestration, not more than 32% of the heat gain or the solar infrared part should transmit through the fenestration. The next part is the U value of the fenestration. And again, according to the standard, it should not exceed 5.7 watts per meter square Kelvin and ideally 3.3. Now, the way you look at uh, solar heat gain versus the U value or the thermal conductance is this, is that the first part, the solar heat gain happens when there's direct incidence of solar radiation on that fenestration. So obviously this is a key consideration during the day. And again, given the use case of this building, which was primarily educational through the day, uh, this was a key factor we wanted to achieve. The second part, which is the thermal conductance, that comes into play due to thermal uh, difference or difference in temperature between one side versus the other side. So in this case, the difference in the outdoor temperature or the ambient temperature through the indoor temperature. Now given that uh, this building was going to be naturally ventilated, this required fenestration to be kept open for a, a large part. And also given that we were not going to air condition most of the building, um, the thermal conductance uh, matter uh, aspect becomes a little less important than the solar heat gain. So what we decided to do here was we selected a product which gave a good SHGC value. Uh, in this case, the product had a value of 0 0.5. And then in combination with the six feet overhangs that we had provided, the effective solar heat gain uh, coefficient comes down to 0.3. So we were able to come under the ideal SHGC value. Uh, and we were also able to come under the U value, uh, given that the product's U value was five watts per meter square Kelvin. We could not achieve the ideal value of 3.3 because that would require double glazing. And given that this was a naturally ventilated building where the fenestration would be kept open most of the times, and also the given cost, which was a very important factor where a double glazed system would increase the window sections and then the cost, uh, we decided to keep uh, adhere to the mandatory requirement and not the ideal requirement. The last part of uh, this is that the visual light transmission of the product uh, was 50%, which was a good balance in letting uh, natural light come in versus avoiding glare. So this led to the selection of the glass for the fenestration. So to summarize uh, what we did in terms of the building envelope was the window to wall ratio was kept at 40%. Uh, 
Uh, this was again in line with the IGBC's new uh, green, green new building standard. Uh, the exterior wall assembly was made out of hollow terracotta clay blocks uh, with plaster on the interior surface and exposed on the outside with an overall U value of about 1 watt per meter square Kelvin. The roof assembly consisted of a double metal skin with glassful insulation in between, achieving an overall U value of 0.5 watts per meter square Kelvin. And lastly, the fenestration consisted of well shaded um, French doors and windows uh, with uh, a glass that had a SAGC value of 0.5 and a U value of 5 watts per meter square Kelvin, with an effective SAGC value coming down to 0.3. The sixth uh, envelope design strategy was access to natural light. So given that um, we are minimizing the heat and uh, we are going to keep the windows open, we wanted to make sure that uh, all the uh, spaces are well, um, uh, have abundant natural light, but not to a point where it becomes a glare and then you are forced to use shades or other kinds of uh, uh, objects like blinds. So as I said before, all uh, regularly occupied spaces have a direct connect to the exterior and also to the interior courtyard and along with that well shaded fenestration with heat control glass that makes sure that there is light without too much of glare and heat. Uh, as I said earlier the glass uh, VLT or visual light transmission value was 50%. What this means is that if again uh, the solar radiation falls on light 50% of the light would stay out whereas 50% of light would come in. Now, this should be looked at in the context of the kind of light or lux level you need to do your tasks. Uh, for um, a building of this sort as per the uh, green new building standard, uh, a minimum level of 110 lux was uh, what was minimal acceptable. And given the spatial layout, the kind of uh, glass used, this was easily achieved uh, in hundreds percent of the regularly occupied spaces. What this led is again, minimal use of artificial lighting during the day. And that's when the building is mostly occupied and used. This again goes back into reducing the energy consumption of the building. So just to summarize what happened. So in terms of the design of energy efficient building, we looked at two things. We looked at all the passive measures, which means the measures that go into the building itself. So again, just to summarize, the strategy number one was the building shape and orientation. So this, the round shape with minimal exposure to the west, breezeways through the south, which is the prevailing wind direction. That was the first strategy. Number two was the central courtyard, which allows for a stack effect, helps ventilation and cross ventilation. Number three was as part of the cross ventilation, making sure that all the regularly occupied spaces have openings in at least two orientations. So in this particular case, every space had an opening into the courtyard as well as an opening into the exterior environment. This makes sure that there is a movement of breeze from one side of the building to the other, making all the interior spaces well ventilated. Strategy four was the adequate shade, shading of the fenestration, which was achieved by the slab overhangs and the roof overhang, which again led to some very usable balcony and walkway spaces. Fifth strategy, which we talked about in detail, was the thermal insulation. So the walls, the roof and the glazing, they were all selected to minimize heat gain from outside into the spaces. The fifth strategy was access to glare-free natural light. So these were the passive or the building uh, related measures that went into the building to keep its energy footprint low. The other side of it was some of the active systems, which means the lighting, the fans, uh, the air conditioning. So some of those choices were LED lights, uh, BE, five star rated ceiling fans, and wherever minimal spaces which required air conditioning, which is the auditorium and a couple of training rooms, a VRV uh, air conditioning system was used, which has a high coefficient of performance and has a low energy footprint.